present and we inspire the future. As usual, we would like this to be a conversational uh, episode and encourage participation from the from the audience. We are all on Teams today, uh, so if you have any questions, comment, experiences that you'd like to share, please put it in the chat box and I'll pick this up and share with um, Sandra. Um, it is my distinct honor to welcome you to today's conversation featuring a rather remarkable leader in our community. Our guest today is Sandra Wallace, CBE. Sandra is a member of the executive board and joint managing director um, at DLA Piper UK and Europe. Um, it's, a, it's a big global business law firm. She also sits on the firm's DNI Council. She served as the UK Social Mobility Commissioner from 2018 to 2021. She's been recipient of a lot of awards. Uh, not an exclusive list. Uh, she's been a recipient of the Law Society Leadership Award, Legal 500 Legal Leading Women Award, Social Mobility Champion of the Year Award in 2020, the Lawyer Hot 100, and she's also listed in the Power List 100 for people of African or Caribbean heritage. Sandra is a mother of three, and she works quite flexibly to balance her career and family life. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much. Thank you. I shouldn't have allowed you to <laughs> list all of those. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to. It's incredible. <laughs> um, so, Sandra, we are so lucky to have you with us today. Uh, and keen to, to, to listen to your inspirational story. If you don't mind, could you share with us, um, rather than my very uh, summary of it, which does not even cover 5% of your achievement, could you share your, your personal, like, your career journey really uh, with us and the key experiences that you found has led you to your current position as a senior executive at, at DLA Piper? Thank you, Maxine, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you all, um, an organisation that I've admired from afar. So it's really nice to be taking part in this event. So Maxine, um, big shout out to you, first of all, for, for inviting me. Um, yes, yeah, so I, as, as Maxine said, I work at a law firm. I'm an employment lawyer by trade, so I still um, practice and that's that's what I do. That's my that's my day job, if you like. Um, but, but yes, I went into managing in the firm about 2015 and I'll, I'll come to that and um, my career journey is one of uh, it's not it's not typical for lawyers I mean um, it is still quite traditional for lawyers to come from um, professional service backgrounds someone in the family a lawyer etc cetera, etc cetera. that wasn't my story um, my story is one where I had was one of six. I live, um, still live, um, in a place uh, called Birmingham. For anyone from Europe, Birmingham is sort of central England. And um, I grew up in a family of six in a in a small place called Lee Bank. Um, my parents had come from Jamaica in twen in the in the fifties, and they. Um, had come not intending to stay to, you know coming to, intending to find work and lots of money and go back to Jamaica build a house etc but that wasn't quite as their experience when they got here not only were the the jobs quite low paid but um so was the the life that they they had here they met in England and married um and and, and got married and I, as I said I'm one of six we lived um my mum was a cleaner for the majority of her career, to her life. My dad was a painter and decorator. And no one in my family had been to university. Professional services was a different world. And the school that I went to was very much, you leave school at 16 and you get a job. And that was certainly my parents' expectations as well, especially to bring one into the house. I'm number five of six. So I had, you know, four people, <laughs> brothers and sisters ahead of me that, basically did just that um, and for me it was really tough I, I was at school and I enjoyed school and I enjoyed learning and I felt that my life could be different and better I didn't really know what that meant I didn't really know 
what that would look like I only knew that I wasn't very happy about being poor um and it wasn't that we didn't ever have food on the table my mom always made sure of that we were always well turned out but not with any clothes that you would quite honorably want to wear today um and also that you know we just didn't have anything we didn't have any luxuries we didn't drive we didn't go on holiday um and so it was very it was a life where you think there must be more than this and I I I remember thinking that quite a lot during my as growing up there must be more than than this life um and um I worked hard it was quite difficult because the school that I went to as I said the expectations weren't there I had I speak pretty much like I'm speaking to you today I'll come back to that but um uh, you know which was p- considered posh people couldn't understand why I was speaking the way I did and so uh, I had um, you know I faced a lot of bullying at school especially for wanting to work and and you know thinking about higher education but also not sounding or looking or talking or wanting to, to having the same expectations so that was quite tough so I went to then I, I left school and went to a, what they a college for to do my what we were called A levels and um, I went right across town to what I call the posh part of town, the people that were going to be serious about their education. But it was like being f- out the frying pan into the pan because I went to a school or I was a college that was great and lots much easier educationally. But, um, uh, you know, just to fish out of water, didn't again, not having going on holidays, not having experiences to talk about, not having a car in the family just made me think that I couldn't, you know, this was this was this was you know when and when was I going to cut a break I suppose my first break was when I went to university and I did that a year after doing my A-levels because when I left college and told my mother I wanted to go to university she wasn't that impressed because she thought another two years of not earning um so I um went to work for a council for a year a local authority and then I went to what was then a polytechnic and for those of you you know anything about law you know typically lawyers go to red brick universities um and um there are only a few of those that really uh, were recognized at the time i didn't i went to a polytechnic wolverhampton very near to where i lived and again everybody says you're not going to be a lawyer going to a polytechnic you're not going to you know it's just not going to happen um fast forward it did happen um i did there was lots of things that happened along the way but it did happen i I joined um, the firm that eventually merged with what is DLA Piper. I was, um, I became a partner within seven years of joining the business. I wish I'd have slowed down a little bit, but I didn't. (laughs) And I, um, and then I uh, was asked to look after the group, employment group and run the employment group at a time when um, there was a lot of changes in employment. So my focus was to make it a lot more of a, a global a European practice rather than just a very focused on the UK um, employment law. Uh, having done that, the business asked me to run the whole of the UK business and all, all, all of the practice groups across the UK. Um, and then I was asked to join the executive by my current CEO, Simon, in 2017 um, to, to, to bring, you know, some what he felt was skills that I'd internationalised the UK a lot more to the executive and to the business so that's my journey lots of things have happened along the way but it certainly wasn't typical it wasn't expected I've uh, you know it wasn't easy um, and there were various intersectionality pieces that came along the way but um, that that's that was my journey to law and people say to me well you wanted to be a lawyer was it a program was it a news, you know, was it, a, Was it? you know, you watched somebody at court and you thought this is for you? No, it was, there was no glamour apart from, my mother didn't want me to do English literature because she didn't understand what job I'd get with that. I thought law sounded good and I didn't like being poor. And that's the reality of the choices I made. Having done that, having said that, I love law and I love what I do. Thank you for sharing that, um, Sandra. 
But I want to delve a little deeper in one of the things that you said, and, and I, I think there are so many things we could take from your journey, and I hope you don't mind that I delve into one of the aspects um, there, which is um, you talked about the intersectionality of your identity. Um, how do you view that intersectionality of your identity as a, a Black woman, uh, at some point a mother, uh, and how, how do you think it influenced your approach uh, to 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 your career or and, and eventually to your leadership role um i i i i was very conscious of being black <laughs> very early in Lee bank it isn't now but at the time we weren't there weren't many black families in the neighborhood so i was very conscious of that never faced particular racism uh until later in life to be honest but um you're just very conscious when you're the when you're the only person in the school or the class or whatever it might be um and i think being conscious of your surroundings and and the fact that you in a particular environment you may be the only black person you may be the only woman which in often in law is sometimes is still the case and uh, not women so much but but being black um mm you're often the only black person in the room. I went to an event recently in one of our offices in, in, in Europe and it was a big client event, fantastic event, but I was the only black person there. And it's just, that is still prevalent. So when you have, when you're, con when that happens and you, and you're conscious of it, you think you, you, I think it opens your eyes to being um, conscious of how people might feel and how people might perceive themselves in a particular environment. And I think if you're a leader, you have to be perceptive about how you come across yourself and how an environment might be perceived or might be taken by or, or felt by a particular experience, person, what their experience is of a particular environment or a meeting or an event. I think that perceptiveness, that sort of consciousness permeates through leadership, because if you have that perspective if you're always thinking well this might be for somebody the first time they've experienced a particular event the first time they've presented to an executive committee if someone's coming to see us as an executive the first time they might be moving into leadership you're thinking right how you know you're so conscious of how the first time you walk into a room and you're the only black person the first time you go to a university when I was visiting universities to decide whether where I was going to go often I would be the only black person in the room you you just think you've got to be mindful of how people experience their everyday surroundings. And I think that if you have that as a leader, it can really help define you. It can really help ensure that you're very conscious and and um, and receptive to how people face experiences that they have and interactions they have with you. So I think it really has shaped who I am and the way I interact with people. And I, and I guess, and, and this speaking from my own experience, it can get pretty tiring, right? Yeah. Um, because every time I meet, and, and not so much now that I'm, you know, so experienced, um, but mm. every time you meet someone new, you've almost got to prove yourself to that person. It's like over and over again, whenever you're the first person in the room, uh, and like you in my university with two black people. And so it's mm. almost, and then through your career, you find yourself being the only one in the room and you've got to prove yourself. Uh, yeah. Once they know you, it's easier, but it's always like a reset, isn't it? And and now, and there's something called code switching, of course, right? Where I now understand that you almost unconsciously change how you speak, how you behave, depending on the audience. And and you've spoken about that. Can you tell us a little bit about code switching? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah I, I code switching. I didn't know the term until a few years ago. But code switching is when you feel that you have to adapt, you have to change the way you speak, the way you act, the way potentially the way you dress in order to fit in with a particular environment. My switching probably happened when I was at school. It started when I was at school and it's, you know, it was, it, it was far too young in my experience, to be honest, to be healthy. But I used to speak with a Jamaican accent. I, as I say, um, my mum and my dad was from Kingston. My mum was from Montego Bay. Five brothers, six, five brothers and sisters and relatives very much. The environment that I mixed with was that. And so I went to school and it, fine. And I spoke exactly as my parents spoke and my sisters and brothers. And I remember teachers saying to me, probably as six or seven, why are you speaking like that? You can't, you know, that's not 
what you know no one will understand you when you speak like that and um it was it, you know it was just like a bit of a wake up call it was like what, what how am i speaking so i became a bit of a mimic because i realized then what she was saying was effectively my jamaican accent was somehow perceived badly or poorly and I wanted to fit in. I wanted to, I didn't want to be seen. If you think I'm very conscious of the fact that I I think and feel that I want to progress and I want to be different and I want to do things differently to the way I'm seeing my brothers and sisters um, do things. And I, I should add that they've all gone back to education and they're all doing amazingly well. Um, but um, I, I, I was nervous about that. So I thought I had to change the way I spoke in order that I could fit in. And I think... That only became more pronounced as I went through educational life, as I went, started my training contract where typically, you know, people will sound much more like me. Even the Brummie accent wasn't really acceptable. Um, And so that was something that was very conscious of. That that does become wearing because that is conscious. You know, I can literally stand on my doorstep and talk to you like this and be having a great conversation with you. And then I could go back to my family and I can say, well, go on, what are you going to do? You know, what are your tart bolts? And people will be like, why is she, you know, if I did that at work, they'd be like, what, what, what is she saying? And why is she talking like that? And so you do, but you switch. And that's what I've done on my career. So I still in with my family. I speak like I've just spoken with you. And then I come out of that environment and I, and I speak like this. That is, that is an experience of lots of people from many communities that are not typically or traditionally perceived or spoken like you would imagine. I think there is more of an acceptance now of different accents and and more knowledge about that. But I think, you know, 30 years ago when I started my career, I know for a fact I would not have got a job. It just it, it, it would just not have happened. Because even at the time when I was studying, people were saying, women, we're just starting to, you know, they're doing more in law, but black women, you know, and that was somewhat a barrister actually said that to me. I used to go to the... Um, chambers down in London to to do debates and and a barrister actually said that to me so it it, you know you I know that had I not conformed and I don't not sounded and acted like um, they were expecting it would have it would have been nigh on impossible for me to get where I am today by the way I love that accent I I (laughs) want to speak (laughs) Uh, but but uh, absolutely uh, I agree with you Um, and 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 also in addition to almost changing part of yourself to to conform um, Sandra do you are there any other challenges and barriers that you encountered in your career as a junior or even currently that you feel you you encounter uh, and how it is that you navigated these because there's so many um uh, women starting out now that are facing similar, and and I, I bet they would love to know how is it that you you navigated some of these barriers that they are starting to see. I mean, for the beginning, I worked, you know, as I said, I was a partner within seven years. That was because I I I felt that it was important that I was better and you know worked longer and went the extra mile and did everything possible to prove that I deserved to be in the place that I was because I didn't feel like I typically would have should have fitted in and so I did everything impossible to convince people that this was the right place but then you realize that the the most pressure is coming from yourself and actually if I look at my career and people actually trying to 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 take anything away from me that those circumstances have been few and far between and in reality a lot of it comes from uh, uh, environmental factors, um, political, social factors that really try and define you and try and pigeonhole you. Um, and I think there's a lot of it internally that you have to overcome. Some of the things I had to overcome, I had to. I, I, I said I was. I didn't have any money. It was great that I. I at the time you got a free um, university education, and if and if depending on your parental income, you got a grant. So. I worked every summer, so I never had any debt because there was no prospect of anyone helping to pay me that debt. So I had to do that. Then I went to law school in Chester, which was um, a very, you know, one of the premium colleges of colleges of law. Um, And then my firm that was sponsoring me and got the job by this stage said they couldn't pay for that year. 
So I thought that was it. At that point, I thought that was it because my parents have no means of getting a loan, have no means of supporting me in that year. And so I thought that was going to be the end. Um, luckily, a bank did um, take references from my employer and they, they they confirmed that they would give me a job at the end of the law school year. They just couldn't afford to pay for it. And so I did get a loan. But had that not happened, that would have that would have been the end of my legal career. And I think um, so that was that was quite a big thing. And that's why I do a lot of the social mobility side is about socioeconomic diversity and how that can be such a big factor in preventing people progressing. It can be a barrier before they've even started, irrespective of how bright they are, how clever they are, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the other barrier is like trying to juggle being a, a woman um, in business and um, have with a family. You know, um, I was the first partner to go part time at the firm and I was pregnant when I went for my partnership interview. So I say I was a woman in a hurry. I was pregnant. I um and I said, I want to go about time at the time. And they were like, OK. Um, and then it was trying to work out how are you going to go part time? How are you going to keep maintain your practice? How, you know, and having children. I was like, what am, uh, what am I doing? Um, somebody said to me, uh, I spoke to the head of a bit of a coach at that time. And I said, I sometimes I don't know if I can manage it all. Um, and and she said, I, and she, I said, I just want to go and work, like just go and work in Oxfam or something and just do something that, just doesn't and she said you just end up running the show this is not about <laughs> who you are this is not about the job this is about who you are and I think that was a real realization for me that if you you you'll be a certain personality you'll face challenges but the reality is you've got to look at those challenges and say how am I contributing and how am I putting pressure on myself with those challenges and that was a real that was real eye-opener so I suppose for me it was about saying whatever challenge I might face um, you know what? Um, what is what negativity am I bringing to this challenge, mm-hmm. and how do I deal with that, or even put it in a box for a while, and say how positively can I can I deal with it? Um, and and for me, um, being a woman and and having three children and bringing that up, it's about sharing those responsibilities. It's about realizing there is no such thing as a superwoman or a man. There are people that have to really try and take control of their own circumstances and remember that they can't do everything and very rarely is everyone expecting you to do everything and you've got to be prepared for things you know to juggle a bit and for some of the things to land on your head and for some of you you catch and I think it's giving yourself a break it's giving your it's giving ourselves a break that sometimes we don't we're not prepared to do because we think we should be able to do it all and and it's just not possible It's not, and I, you know, that sort of realization helped me when I was facing challenges that, you know, ordinarily would have set me off, um, set me off course. Mm. And and I'm going to bring in imposter syndrome because I'd like to get your view on 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 that. I mean, do you feel that there are times in your life where you've suffered with that? Is that real? Oh, it's very real. It's very. I mean, maybe not now. I mean, I'm sitting on the executive of you know three billion pound company so I I people will probably say you, you've not done too badly but my the point was for a long time I thought a lawyer was someone that went to Oxford and Cambridge had the amazing grades went to amazing schools went on holiday to Val Bazaar, knew how to golf knew how to you know network knew what wine to order um didn't go out and literally buy a sandwich when someone said do you want to go for lunch you know you didn't you know I mean literally the faux pas that I made along the way because I had no idea what expectations were um you know I I remember thinking I mean I can't even tell you some of them they're too embarrassing the fact is (laughs) you know (laughs) you 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 bring all that into your work and you think okay I've got to hide a lot of the fact that I mean I remember going to someone asking what university did you go to and I'm thinking for a split second should I lie that was how difficult it was it was just feeling that if I tell the person that it's not what they were expected to hear they were going to think differently of me or poorly of me I didn't think I fit or I didn't think I wasn't as clever as they would have expected a typical lawyer to be that stuck with me for a long time now I use that perhaps to 
to make sure that others know that it's okay to feel like that um it that it's okay to sometimes just have that split second of am i just not going to be able to live up to expectations um but you can't let that d- determine your life it's very important that you don't even if you have to box it up a while and bring it out and put it back and you can't let it dictate because obviously a lot of it's in your head a lot of it was in my head as I said I've been I've had a very successful career here um and it can actually mean that you don't go for things you know this there's a this managing director role that I'm in now I thought was is this a step too far? I've run the UK, but is this a step too far? 15 countries I look after now. Um, and I was, I'm in an RM with my boss and he said, I need you. I actually, and you know, I never thought about it like that because I'm always thinking, can I do it? Can I do it? Am I good enough? And he said, I need you. Now that's, that's a quite a powerful thing for somebody to say, because then suddenly you stop thinking about all the things you can't do, but all the things that you're contributing that actually can enhance the leadership team or enhance an environment or enhance a job role. And I think if we can just try and think, what do people need about what I can contribute to this business rather than what can't I do, then I think you'll they'll be in a happier place. And I certainly was as a result of sort of that sort of expression of statement of why they wanted me to join the executive. Fantastic. And and now I'm going to go have a look at the chat. So as a reminder, this is where you are to be. Yes, you have not <laughs> made a mistake joining. We are, this will be in conversation with uh, the Sandra Wallace, <laughs> our CBE. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, experiences that you want to share, uh, please uh, I'll put it in the, in the chat box uh, and I'll read it. And we have one from Neil, Neil Griffiths. Um, So Neil is saying that he's heard that imposter syndrome is a concept invented by the majority group in order to uh, for minoritized groups to feel different and therefore not part of something. With that in mind, he would like to think about situations that you are describing as impostering moments. Mm. Uh, Otherwise, we build a perception that there's something wrong with us. Um, mm. And 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 we've heard that before, by the way, from a couple of weeks ago. One of the ladies thought that imposter syndrome is 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 makes us we find a reason and we put it in the box that this is the reason why I couldn't do it. I'm a woman and I couldn't do it because of that. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, uh, Sandra. I suppose for me, whatever you call it, yeah, we have we create environments where people feel they can't be themselves or being themselves isn't good enough and I wish it was just moments (laughs) I suppose I wish it was just something that happened from time to time but in my experience and having worked with um, lots of different groups and organizations especially looking at socioeconomic diversity and inclusion and the barriers that people face it it unfortunately it does define them it might not be it might be somebody else imposing it or it might be but it does define them and it can define them and and it sometimes isn't as simple as just saying it's a moment in time but otherwise it's okay i i think i think the reality is it can be a lot more than that and i can see it stopping development stopping educational attainment stopping people going for positions to such an extent <laughs> that it's it's something that we do need to acknowledge. It's something that we do need to try and guard against. Mm. But it can it can end up defining somebody's future. And so I do think it's something that we have to acknowledge that isn't just um, a, you know a, a fad or something that people just need to perhaps get over. I don't think that's what the the commentary is saying I'm just saying please be aware that for some people it's a lot more than just a moment in time or Mm. a moment that they face yeah no thank you for the commentary on that Mm. um now Sandra before we go into a lot of some of your Mm. DEI and advocacy uh uh, and activism in this space and we're so keen to hear about that too you you mentioned that you know someone had given you advice you 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 talked about the help that someone had given you uh, uh to push you through um are there any mentors 
or role models that have influenced you? What do you think the importance of these people are in our careers? Um, mentors and, and people that influence you have to start really early. Because I think for me, if your first mentor is at your career, for a lot of people, it will be too late. Um, and we've got to look for people, in my view, that can influence and shape um, someone's journey um, from school age. So that's something that I think is important when you talk about some of the things that I do. I think people have to get involved, organisations have to get involved in not only and have a responsibility, not only in terms of their workforce and the diversity, but they've got to get involved in their community and they've mm. got to look outside and think, what do they need to do? in order to ensure um, people are, are, are feel sponsored and mentored. So that's something that I think is quite important from very early on. Did I have mentors? In uh, The reality is no. Um, I didn't really have any. I didn't, I, there were no other, I, I, you know, I didn't know of anyone that really had come from a similar background at the firm at the time. Um, but uh, there were people that believed in me, sure. And there were people that encouraged me to believe in myself. Um, and then as I got more senior, then I would I would reach out to people and say, I would be really good to chat to you about your experience or what you think I could do. Mm. Um, and so, yes, at that point, you know, as, as, I, as I got more senior as a lawyer, I was I was reaching out to people. But sort of mentorship programs, sponsorship programs didn't really exist. So mm. you, it was either a case of muddling through or mm. finding people that were willing and invested in seeing you do well. I think it's critical. I think it's really important, not only because um, it, you can learn from others, because the best thing you can do is learn from other people and find out where they might have had difficulty and how you can make sure you don't do the same or the best practice that has really supported them. But also it it just gives you a different perspective from, from different people. So the more people you can you can reach out to and get that perspective from, I think is really important. So I probably had a a sponsor if you like at school there was a teacher that absolutely did believe that I could do more um than than was expected and when I got into the law firm that I'm in now yeah there was there was um the, some women in the team in the employment team that really um, inspired me and worked with me and sort of you know collaborated in order to try and it, it progress and I think that is really important um uh, and now, even in our leadership role, I have reverse mentoring um, just so I can people tell you less or people tell you what you want to hear, the more senior you get. So you just need to make sure you have people that can tell you straight, really, yeah. um, and be prepared for difficult conversations. Be prepared for people to say that you're not my role model, actually, because I don't like the way you do it, something or I don't think it's achievable the same way you've done it or whatever it might be. You've got to be prepared to hear things that you don't want to hear um, mm. or you weren't expecting in that mentoring role as well. Not just not all. It's not all uplifting necessarily, um, <laughs> but it, you should take lessons from it. Hey, and now we we are. Oh, yes, we have another question come through before we move on. Yeah. Um, so we've got one from Elvira. Thank you for that. Um, hi, Sandra. What are the skills and abilities that you have acquired through your specific journey to law and executive roles and that you see as a strength relative to people who have had a more normative journey? Uh, I think I am quite down to earth, uh, which is quite important, really, when people want to progress <laughs> I don't think anyone feels that they can't come and have a conversation with me you know they can't find some time in my diary I'm pretty what you see is what you get um, and I think that's quite an important characteristic because I think the more aloof you are the more untouchable you are the less likely you're really going to get the pulse of an organization and the feel for what people are thinking mm. so I think that's quite important you know don't don't feel you have to act or be a certain way just to because as you progress so I, I say we'll stay down quite down to earth I think I'm good at listening I don't have to be the only voice in the room I don't have to be the loudest voice in the room um, sometimes I don't speak at all if it, if the environment requires me just to be listening and I think people find that quite hard especially lawyers 
because <laughs> because that's what we do right we like to we like we think that everybody wants to know our opinion <laughs> and our advice and so we we sometimes are not the best at waiting to hear and listen and really and really listen I remember when the Black Lives and um, George Floyd killing happened and a lot of people were coming out especially in the law and saying you know we're sponsoring this and we're we're, we're putting money into that and we're doing lots of things and isn't this outrageous and and a lot of people said in the firm to me you know what what are you doing and why are we not making any statements and why are we not doing all these things and I said aren't you more interested in what we haven't been doing over these years aren't you more interested to challenge me about the fact that I'm the only black person on the executive and that we still have a lot to do in terms of the leadership of a law firm and I'll the re, when I'll shout about it and I'll be out there I'll be the first one to shout about it when I've got my house in order and I think it's very important that we are not the first voice in the space sometimes because sometimes that voice isn't authentic um and I think I a, a skill I, I perhaps have as well is to re, you're just relating to people I think that is a good thing about a lawyer you're interested in people you're a bit nosy you're a bit you're invested in finding out getting to the truth getting to the root of something and I think that's a skill that's actually quite useful because people feel like you're interested in them and you're interested in their development um, and you're invested in, in in getting things right for them so those are probably the things that I've I've stood me in the best stead, I think. Yeah, fantastic. And I did like that comment. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that was a good response back to the firm. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your your activism, your advocacy uh, within um, uh, and promoting DEI. Specifically, uh, mm. you were the UK Social Mobility Commissioner from mm. 2018 to 2021. Wow, right? That mm. is impressive. And like everybody on here, I would like to know, how did you get into that role? Um, that, so what it, uh, a lot of people was talking to me about my journey as you do and things that that impacted you and there's like I said the intersectionality of my being a black woman and leader in a business from a uh, uh, more disadvantaged background and I hate that word I don't never because my 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 family were amazing but 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 having no money is a disadvantage right whether you like it or not um so uh, so that's in that sense I talk about disadvantage that it was probably that part that influenced mo- the, me the most in terms of how I progressed and what I thought about and what pushed me and, dr- and, and drove me and I thought about all the times when I could have fallen a- away from the career that I'm in now because of my social economic background because I didn't go to the right school because I didn't have the, the top grades because I didn't go to the right university because I didn't know so many things, social etiquettes that were expected. And that for me was if I could get to the level I am in my organisation and add the value that I hope I do, how many people could be that, could do that mm. and don't even have a get a look in, don't even have an opportunity to do that. But it, and I can do that to an extent in the law firm. So we have a Head Start program that sponsors people from school age through to university or their chosen professional career. It doesn't have to be law um, and providing financial mentoring and other um, support. We, we do apprenticeships. So, again, if your route to law is um, you can't afford to go to university, an apprenticeship scheme is available. We do solicitor apprenticeships and other types of apprenticeships as well. There was lots of things we were doing in the firm with other law firms but actually that was with this presupposed you got to that stage yeah. <laughs> you could get to that stage and so the social mobility commission was a commission that was um it's a government body set up by Theresa May no um David Cameron and Nick Clegg um, they changed it from the um the child poverty commission to be the social mobility commission and it was looking at the whole Chibang. look all the factors that could influence someone's ability to progress and mm. not just when they got into their career and I felt that given my journey and the things that I'd faced before I'd even got into law I would want to, I wanted to do something that 
started earlier so looked at early years education that looked at poverty that looked at the taxation system that looked at um mm. you know social mobility within different professions and organizations the civil service we did a big report on the civil service and the, 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 the one of the most inclusive organizations at entry level but when it became to top civil service we saw just how that changed to who you knew, where you went to school, <laughs> fireside conversations, really, um, that, that that led to who who progressed in those organisations. So that being able to open up other organisations and open up the agenda in so many different ways became quite important to me. And that's how I came. So I applied to be a commissioner. I had to go through a process and apply. And then I then when I was a commissioner, we lobbied hard that it, it, we sat in the Department for Education and I lobbied hard for us to get moved to the cabinet office because I felt it was more important that we, we, um, the whole cabinet and the whole all of the treasury were thinking about social mobility and not just the education, not just the Department for Education. So that was sort of some of the things I did. And and if you if you can improve social mobility, you can improve it intersects with so many other things. Yes. Because if you look at the people that are poor education attainment um uh, then you can sit and you look at ethnic minorities and representations in that if you look at women's representation in terms of um the career ladder and and the socioeconomic diversity that will impact women and people um with disabilities it all intersects a mm. lot of the time with where you started and where you came from and your socioeconomic background and so i was able i felt able to touch lots of different areas just by going focusing on this and that's 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 why that became my focus sorry a very long answer but it's something I feel very passionately about <laughs> and I all. want people to be thinking about it and um because it is so important I'm just here wondering how on earth you've got a family you're doing a full-time role managing 15 officers you're still the commissioner like and we'll get to that because maybe you know something that I don't know and I'm feeling <laughs> badly uh, uh, so we'll come to that later whatever super will like she knows <laughs> skills you've got, you've got to share with us today but um it, 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 staying within um the social mobility uh we have a question from Nathan mm. and I think that's a really good one and uh, Nathan says one of the most difficult aspects of socioeconomic progression is regional inequality in the UK. Yes. What is one of the ways you think this can be changed? Yeah. So one of the things the commission looked at was to identify what we called hot spots and cold spots in the UK. Mm. So that if the government were aware of areas that suffered from greater socioeconomic de um, deprivation, they could target their resources and target their interests much more into those areas and that is something that they that we still a lot to do but they have started to think about and uh, a lot more so it's identifying those places uh, i think there should be a greater move to devolved um uh government so that again uh, if the authorities in charge of the areas that have the greatest need how can pinpoint that and really direct them to areas where they can improve um the the the, the access to opportunity to facilities to provision then it would be a lot easier than central government trying to 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 give everybody the same part and so that is what we tried to do as a commission was target those areas um those areas of deprivation and oldham is um forgive me again for anyone that's in europe and doesn't know but it's an area um, in the north of England, and that is an area that has benefited greatly from a much greater focus on um, um, socioeconomic diversity and the need to improve um, college provision, education provision, child welfare, access to sc school meals. And by targeting it in that way, because they could see what the problem areas are, they were, they were able to make some progress. And I think that's quite an important um uh, a thing to do. The government, as you probably also noticed, has also started to move some of its civil service provision out of mm. the out of London. So um, Wolverhampton um, has transport now. There's there's a big um, civil service presence in Leeds. So again, if you move, if you say to people, and that's why I never left Birmingham. Everybody thought I should live in London. I'm of course I'm a I'm a lawyer. I'm you know a manager. I must move to London. I never moved because people have to know that you can succeed regionally you mm. don't have to leave your family and your friends to succeed that's that's a that's that's a lot of reason why people fail 
um, in their chosen careers and their professions because they left, they've left their network, they've left their stability to go and seek a job and, and, it, and often it doesn't work out. So it's a really good point. It's a really good question. And that regional inequality does need to be addressed. Great. Um, we we would also like to know, and, and as a firm, Carney is, is is starting on its journey uh, within within um, social mobility uh, advocacy, if I might call it that way, and looking at what can firms do, right? You know, how do you envisage the future of social mobility and diversity in leadership positions, and what steps do you think are necessary to achieve greater inclusivity? You know, so because people could come in from different backgrounds, and and I say. You increase the number visible. Yeah. How uh, that, that inclusion piece is so important mm. uh, because you don't want groups of people being miserable and not thriving in organization after all these initiatives are put in place. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to think of them as not, um, we have to think about things as not one offs or. Mm. Um, it's, you know, something that's you've got to think about it fundamentally. And if you look at your website, you talk about how fundamental diversity and inclusion is to you and the people that are with working with you. And so wouldn't you want to know if you're only attracting a certain type of person, if you're only attracting and that could be, you know, very rich black people you know <laughs> doesn't have to be that they have to be white you know but are you attracting the same sort of people or what it might might well be I'm not and the only way you can do that is to gather data and mm. and to understand what the makeup of your organization is and we gather social mobility data by asking a simple question there's, there's a website I can refer you to to give you more information on this but you know educational what was the occupation of your parents or carers at age 14 mm. because a lot of people say oh social mobility it's great but it only works in the UK because free school meals doesn't really work elsewhere and education is free elsewhere so it doesn't really work and it's because you've got a class system but if you ask that question um, on that that background question at age 14 mm. then that gives you an idea of the sort of makeup of the socioeconomic uh, makeup of your workforce and then you might find you haven't got an issue <laughs> you know there's <laughs> many organizations out there that are really mixed and really um really diverse in terms of backgrounds and people's experience and and how they came to work at the organization and, and it might be fine but in the legal world unfortunately because there's been a lot of um work on this and a lot of um, we are um, we are required to gather that data by our regulatory mm. body has found that predominantly people come from professional backgrounds who become lawyers in the UK and therefore that doesn't um, bode well for the diversity of our thought and experience and the communities in which we thrive so that is that's what you can do is start gathering that data and the and you but it's hard because people think why do they want to know what background why do they want to know what my parents did and and so you have to you have to story tell you have to say why is this important you know this is somebody's journey and how much easier could we have made it if we'd have known um i did a talk to a bank recently and someone that was on the um ball reached out to me afterwards and they said they hadn't gone to pr promotion because they didn't want to have to, they, the educational background was still going to become, was relevant to the application and they weren't going to go for it because no one had appreciated they'd come from the background that they had. So it could be holding people back in your organisation mm -hmm. that are happily working in their role, but just close their minds after progression. And so I do think you can gather that data. That will give you a better idea of what you're looking at as an organisation but you have to story tell, you have to explain why you're gathering that data so people understand that it's about removing barriers. So the opportunities and the and the people feeling that they can go for opportunities isn't prohibited by where they believe they've come from and what people expect. Mm. And, and I think this is it's important to mention that you know I have lately come across people and we speak about other parts of the UK. Within London, I am involved with an organization and people had not. They were the first people, and these are people in 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 junior school, in in um high school, secondary school, who have not seen anybody in their families go past A level, who have not been to the city, not to the strand, definitely not, couldn't see a future where there could be anything more than they've seen in their families. Uh, most of the families didn't speak any English, 
And you also mentioned that it's important to do some of these initiatives at an earlier age. Yes. How have you done that? How have you, uh, um, what initiatives are, are there yeah. to, to get to that age where it's critical for people to carve their, you know, to inspire their futures? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's working alongside schools. There's lots of organisations out there that you, it's hard for a school to just rock up and say, oh, I want to talk to your pupils. You know, schools have got enough. Teachers have got lots to do. But lots of organisations do um, partner, partner with schools to, in order that you can offer, offer people opportunities, not if necessarily to work experience, because that's sometimes hard and the environment, it doesn't quite work, but just bring them into the city remembering to pay bus fare and train fares because you know sometimes people can't afford to do it um and then they go and just to have understand what an office is about and understand what it means to come into the city we we do that here you know just getting them interacting another thing that i would love to see us doing a lot more of is um going into you know parents evenings now covid is over parents evenings are back up and running but wouldn't it be great to have a stand at the back of parents evenings where there was lots of different law firms or lots of different you know talking to the parents of children that mm. are not thinking about their children going into these professions so as they're walking out after hearing about how their son or daughter have done yeah. they can see a stand that says look law is something that that yeah. these people are thinking about you know and their parents are thinking about because often if you talk to my mum and dad they had no idea about any of this stuff all they could see was a long period with no money coming in and a long period when I wouldn't have any money and they just worried for me and they worried quite frankly you know for themselves they need it as well and and you know opening their eyes to the possibilities and so on so that's something I'd love to see happening a lot more because we're there anyway we know parents even having all the time so that that would be something that I would want um I'd want to I want to see happen but there's lots of partnerships you can do in schools and I would you know happily put you in touch with any if any anyone was interested um but we do need to get to people a lot earlier and we should think about sponsoring people you know um through as we do yeah um all right. Um, no, that that's fantastic, and we would definitely be coming for, for for all the tips from you. I'm sure <laughs> that the audience would love to get involved, and sometimes even knowing what to do is is a difficult thing. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time. You I know. know. We could spend Sorry, all day about. with you, <laughs> <laughs> but we know you're a very busy woman. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat, so anyone that has it has a uh, very few minutes, or I'm just gonna take it up. Right. So ask the questions now or I'll keep going uh, with my <laughs> questions. Um, we would like to know some other things going back, going back to what advice would you give to a younger Sandra? Um, you know, mm. young Sandra, choose whatever age young Sandra is. <laughs> what advice would you give to young Sandra? Um, well, if I was to start at the beginning of my legal career I'd say young Sandra needed to start a lot of this outreach and a lot of this work a lot earlier the fact is I was so motivated for my own career and showing everybody how good I was and I could do it and I could succeed that maybe I I wasn't a voice as early as I should have been um so I would say Sandra you know that that's something think about what your contribution could be now don't yeah. wait till you're in a management role or you're whatever um, if I was even younger than that, I would say don't give yourself such a hard time. Give yourself a break. Um, you know, don't be in such a rush, maybe, and think about what it is that you want to achieve and why and what's holding you back rather than just thinking I've got to go for this and worry about it later. Um, mm. And I think I'd also say that you have got to have courage and not not you know have be able to say to, to call out things I didn't call out enough things I think as I was progressing in my career things that were, were not right um and I think you have to have a little bit of courage and be you know not in an aggressive way not in an antagonistic way but you have to be able to say do you know what you know I'm, I don't think that's great behavior and I think I think mm -hmm. I would have called out things maybe sooner than I did not yeah. wanting to rock the boat and I think you have to be brave sometimes um for people that may not have a voice or feel they have a voice so those those are some of the things I'd probably say and have fun I was very serious <laughs> of course yes <laughs> I um, was so like Ooh. yeah have fun <laughs> enjoy <laughs> yeah and 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 what would that change and if, if I asked you um to say what is the best 
um, what what one thing do you want everybody to take away from today? I don't know if it's a similar thing, but everybody on this call, what one thing do you, do you want them to take away from today's talk? Um, just spend some time if you if social mobility isn't your thing, if you don't really right. know much about it. Um, look at go to the Social Mobility um, Commission website um, or socialmobilityworks.org. Um, and just find more, find out a bit more about social mobility and how it interacts and intersects um, with other areas of diversity and inclusion and what, what part we can play in that. And just think about whether any of your recruitment practices, any of your, whether official or unofficial, could be creating barriers from people who, you know, haven't actually disclosed to you that they feel, um, you know, some of this thing could, could be holding them back. So I'd, I'd ask you to think about those things, but essentially, um, you know, just keep the topic going, really. Just keep the conversation going. Um, this is Black History Month. This, you know, every month we should be thinking about these issues and thinking about what difference we can make in our organisation and also the communities that surround us. So that's what I would say. Great. And... This is completely, I'm going to throw this on you because we like to know <laughs> this, right? We like to know this. Sandra, who would play you in a movie, in your a movie of your life story? <laughs> who would play me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. You can do it, Maxine. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I um, my life story, somebody that, that maybe... Um, from a similar background, I hope. <laughs> Someone not famous but needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Hey, Sandra, it's been wonderful. It's been such a treat. I've been waiting for this, I should say, my whole life. But that would be a bit cheesy. I have literally, and I know that everybody on here, we've been really going to have you um, come to speak to us. You are definitely an inspiration for so many and thank you so much for the work you do and by the way whenever it's time that you did start you made such an impact that it makes up for not starting much earlier <laughs> and and thank you for pushing the country right uh in this course because it's so important and not many people know about social media in fact people don't even understand what it is and yeah. sharing your story is so courageous and helps so many people at Carney, we are so blessed to have had you talk to us. And I know that you've changed my uh, uh, many of our minds today to do more in that space. So thank you for telling us that we need to speak up more about <laughs> things that are not right. Uh, and then we need to be courageous. I'm going to take this away with me as well. And then lastly, to spend some time learning more about social mobility and how we can help in that space. And not just during Black History Month, but every day, right? So we'll be coming to you for all the tidbits you promised. <laughs> so I'll be dropping you a line and like, what should we be doing? And I know the rest of the office will be great, grateful for those tips. So thank you so much, uh, Sandra. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Maxine. Thanks for inviting thank me. You. And thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.